although slightly atypical, uh, I'd like to uh, have our little discussion, my drash, the sermon, before our Yizkor uh, commemoration, if uh, you will indulge me. I think you'll see the connection as we go. Who is, or was, the best president of the United States of America? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Why? Preserve the reunion, reluctantly freed the slaves. Now, you know, that reluctance is kind of important. I mean, this is not exactly somebody that, certainly by modern standards, would be considered a moral person, given that he was not opposed to slavery in and of itself for most of his life, uh, and only did so at the end because he felt that it would be a necessary component of shattering the South and bringing them to heel. And as he said quite explicitly, if he could save the Union without freeing the slaves, then that's what he would have done if that had been an option. Yes, Eli? He also gave the go-ahead to do total war. And he also gave the go-ahead to do total war, although he wasn't the first person to do it. It was the first uh, instance in America of total war. He was somewhat in favor of resettlement uh, for the freed slaves, to, that they should return back to the African continent. So why are we listing him as the best? Is there no one better? I mean, is this best by process of elimination? <laughs> the other presidents, he was the best. That's the nature of superlatives, right? Yeah, you're not, you're, you're going to throw another candidate in? John Adams. John Adams. Wait, wait, we got the Sedition Act in the back. Uh, but yeah, there, there were some issues. Uh, he did not do anything to, uh, to end the institution of slavery, and we can say, well, he couldn't have back then. Clearly, he was an abolitionist at heart, but he did not have the gumption to do anything about it. Great men don't necessarily make great presidents. He defended the British soldier. Uh, he defended the British soldier at the, um, the, 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 the Boston Massacre. Uh, he did a lot, and he also didn't do a lot, and he did some things that we don't like. Well, he didn't get along with anybody, but he was a great man. Yeah. So says all of those uh, who are still alive, <laughs> but none of the people when he was alive. Yeah, right. Right, you, you, right. What's the, old, the old joke is, what's the difference between a statesman and a politician? A statesman is a dead politician. Okay, so, all right, so we, we're clearly I've hit some historical nerves here. Clearly, let's try something a little bit less controversial. Who was the best rabbi? Oh, come on. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, except he never te technically had the title rabbi. Uh, it was kind of a posthumously uh, awarded ordination. Uh, he, he had Micha only from God, not from other rabbis. So whether he counts as a rabbi or not is up for debate. But even Moshe, was Moshe a perfect leader? Was he a perfect person? No, pretty far from it. We know multiple accounts of things that different um, sages have come up with for the reason why God refused to let him enter into the land of Israel. But we certainly can all agree he did something that was so bad that God refused to let him enter the land of Israel after everything that he had done. We also know that he grew up 40 years having no objection to the slavery around him. We know that the first time he got in trouble, he ran away. We know that uh, he had difficulty letting go and changing near the end of his life to recognize the transformation of the people of Israel under his leadership. We can certainly not call him perfect by any stretch. And if we were to go down the list and look at people like Rabbi Akiva, well, Rabbi Akiva backed the wrong horse and in many ways helped precipitate the Bar Kokhba revolt that ended up in worse destruction and deprivation for our people and a loss of a substantial number of people in the land of Israel, which weakened our hold upon that land and left us dispersed across the world. 
He might have been brilliant, but... And if we look at the other sages, Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rabbi, even Rabbi Hillel was not so perfect that when he finally passed, his students were not able to remember perfectly what he had taught, and so they ended up debating with Beit Shammai for the next generations. It's hard to come up with, with a perfect one, isn't it? Or even someone we'd say best without having very legitimate complaints against them. There's no perfection? But by the... They're, they're, we, all we are all works in progress, and there is no perfection. Indeed, Judaism does not ask us to be perfect. Uh, it asks us to be perfecting, that is to say, working on that project. But by nature of grammar, there still has to be a best. There still has to be, because of the way superlatives work, at least in English and most other languages as well, one that is superior to all the others. If, if you ignore the slaveholding, and you ignore his work in the American in the Indian Wars prior to the Revolution, where he butchered countless people, he was a great guy. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> okay, so we got a lot of American history buffs here, but I'd like to bring you to a more modern rabbi that many people have tried to advance as being a great rabbi, but maybe not the best. Uh, maybe you've heard of Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach, right? Many of the melodies that we have uh, included in our Kabbalat Shabbat service in particular uh, come from Rabbi Kalbach, and I happen to uh, study under uh, one of his uh, ordinees, uh, a woman. Uh, that he ordained back before that was fashionable in the Orthodox uh, fringe community, uh, Rabbi Mi Re Reb Mimi Feigelson, an amazing scholar, teacher, look her up, read her, and, and see her if you ever get the opportunity. Uh, and she told a story that came from when he passed away, when the, uh, the community, the congregation was sitting shiva uh, in New York for the passing of their beloved rabbi. And she told the story like this, and I apologize in advance if I get some of the details wrong, but by the very nature of the story, the details are flexible. So as people are gathered together during a memorial service there in New York, the doors are flung open, and in walks in the biggest black man anyone had ever seen. The man was a giant, muscles everywhere, huge, rippling muscles, tattoos, scars, mean scowl on his face, and everyone is terrified, petrified of what's he doing, or what's going on. You know, there have been some tension in New York in different communities, and everybody is petrified. And the man walks up, and finally he says, I'm here to pay respects to the Rebbe, because he always talked to me on the street when I was out there, and that helped me change my life. Beautiful story, everybody is amazed, and tears well up in the room. The problem, Reb Mimi said, is that that's not how the story began. The first version of the story that she heard was that a black man came to visit the shiva and to say how much the Rebbe had done for him. In the next version, he got a little taller. In the next version, he got a little more bulky. In the next version, he got a, a, a scar or a tattoo or a meaner look. He continued to grow in the telling of this story until he was this giant John Henry of a man that was going to tear off people's arms. Now that's a very interesting way to tell a story, to grow a story, to exaggerate a story. But it was done for a very good reason. Well, two good reasons. One. It's storytelling 101 to exaggerate. And by exaggerating, you build the tension, you build the suspense, and everybody is more on what's going to happen with this person. And of course, it means that his presence is even more out of place in the minds of those that are listening, which is why the punchline that Rabbi Karlbach would talk to this man came as such a shock. And of course, as testimony, 
to how different Rabbi Karlbach was from you and me. Because we would never go talk to the huge, giant, menacing black man on the street, but Rabbi Karlbach would. Wasn't he a saint? Turns out he wasn't a saint. I don't know if you know, uh, it's, there have been a number of allegations of abuse and harassment, uh, sexual harassment that, were, that he perpetrated. Um, but this is what's known as hagiography. The, the writing of the stories of those that we wish to beatify, that those we would wish to turn into saints. Even the Daniel Jordan girl when he was growing up, I didn't know that. I just I'll have to hear that full story. <laughs> but a lot of people, <laughs> perhaps at the start of the story, it might have been. But I want you to compare that story with a common midrash that we are probably all familiar with, because you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Rabbi, don't we write hagiography? Don't we write these saintly type stories about our ancestors, about the people in the Torah, about our sages all the time? Don't we also try to beatify them in the retelling of their life in a way that exaggerates and puts them on this pedestal? Well, tell me the difference between the Karabakh story and this one of Avraham Avinu. Abraham, our father, when only a small child, was left in charge of the idol shop run by his father, Terah. We all know the story, right? And as his father left, he took and smashed all of them and put a stick in the hands of the biggest one. And when his father came back, he said, what happened here? And Avram, or Avram as he was known at that point, said, you won't believe it, Dad, which is always a sign someone's lying. <laughs> But a woman came in and wanted to make an offering to one of the sacrifices, and they all began arguing about who was the most powerful god, and they started fighting. And eventually, the big one over here smashed all the others and took the sacrifice. And the father says, what, do you take me for a fool? And Abraham says, well, if you know they have no power, then why do you worship them? Burn, all right? <laughs> Mic drop, Abraham walks off stage. Well, what's the difference between that story and the story of Karlbach? Apart from the fact that Abraham's story is a little funnier. Well, the difference in my mind is that each one of us can imagine ourselves being Abraham. In fact, the story is told in such a way to not detract from Abraham's insight to the falsity of idolatry, but instead to enhance our own understanding that idolatry is stupid. And that each one of us could imagine ourselves being in that room with Tara walking out to go get his Starbucks and smashing the idols because we were going to teach our dad a lesson about how idolatry was stupid. Each one of us could be Abraham. The Midrash makes Abraham more accessible to us. Rather than being this figure that just pops out of nowhere, appearing on the stage as this full-grown figure that is striding across the land of Israel in constant conversation with God. We see him as, as a child, recognizing a simple truth about the world that we all believe we would have imagined too, even if we hadn't been born with the advantage of following his example. Abraham is us in that story. And Abraham instructs us on how to be us, because quite honestly, most of us, had we been raised in idolatry, would not have come to that same conclusion, as evidenced by the fact that billions of people went for generations and didn't come to that conclusion. But we can imagine ourselves doing it. The Karlbach story, on the other hand, was designed explicitly to make Karlbach not us, to make him more than us, to give him courage and insight and compassion beyond what we would have or could have. It doesn't inspire us to emulate Karlbach. It inspires us to venerate Karlbach. And that is a fundamental difference between hagiography and what our sages do with Midrash. When our sages teach us stories about Abraham or, or Isaac and Jacob or Moses or David and they fill in some of the blanks in the narrative, they're not filling in those blanks to show us that we could never be those people, not just to teach us to venerate, although we should, of course, respect them, but instead to inspire and guide us in our own actions so that we can live a better life, a better way of living, to find not only more happiness but more peace. 
and to recognize that they are not there to be unreachable icons etched into stained glass that loom over us, reminding us of our insignificance, but that they are, well, our rabbis. They are our teachers. They are the ones who guide us in how, how to live. And both by their imperfections and by their successes, we get closer to that understanding for ourselves. Judaism prefers the Abraham style of story. In the modern world, unfortunately, even in the Jewish communities, we have tilted towards the hagiographies and towards the veneration rather than inspiration, which is a great and deep shame. But when you hear a story of someone's life, whether it be a great person or whether it be someone from you, your family, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, ask yourself, is the story being told and am I telling the story if you are the storyteller? Am I telling the story so that everyone will bow down in worship of this person that exceeds the human capacity? Or am I telling or hearing this story to be inspired by this person, to know that I too could do something like that? That I too could be guided, led, and lifted up beyond where I currently am? Not to be venerated, not to be beatified, not to leave the ranks of mere mortals but to simply elevate myself through the lessons of those who have walked the path before me. The walls of our congregation are alight with the memories of those who have come before us. Our hearts are full, especially on a day when we commemorate through our Yisker service the lives of those who have come before us. There is always a tendency to perhaps venerate loved ones who have gone before to try and exaggerate the characteristics that they had, to think of them as being larger than life. And while that may be a way to look at them through the lens of love, I am sure that what they want is not only your love, and not just respect, but for you to see them for who they were, in the fullness of their life, in the completeness of their identity, not to erase the small mistakes, not to erase even the pain that may have existed between you, but to learn from it, to be inspired by their life, for every life is a struggle and every life has a lesson to give. When we remember our loved ones, it is not to move them closer and closer to the elevation of sainthood. We remember them to move ourselves closer and closer to the ideal that all of us, those here and those who have passed, strive for, the ideal of Torah, the ideal of life. We remember them because it makes this life a better place, and that is what they would wish. Shabbat Shalom and Chag Sameach.